Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast. This is Bruce Hutchin, host and executive producer. Each week, you will hear tips, techniques, strategies, and personal stories from some of the best and funniest whitetail hunters in North America. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you do, tell a friend on social media. If not, tell me and I'll make it better. Thanks for listening, folks. This is Whitetail Rendezvous, episode number 409. We're heading to Iowa today, and we're going to connect with Hunter Brunk. Hunter and his brother Trevor have a YouTube channel called Brunk Outdoors, where they set up and film realistic hunts. They do a lot of ground blind hunting, but more important to that, they're passionate about sharing their ideas about how to pick the right trail, hunting the wind, making sure that you get far enough away from the parking lot so you have non-pressured deer. It's all coming up, folks. You're going to enjoy it. Hunter Brunk from Brunk Outdoors. Hey, folks, I'm with Hunter Brunk today. Hunter's out of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and he's one of the young guns in the whitetail world. He's got his own YouTube channel called Brunk Outdoors. Hey, Hunter, what's up? Hey, Bruce. Thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to uh, do the show and, and share some of my views on the white tail world. So thanks for having well, me. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. And like I said, you're one of the young guns in the white tail world. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the youth in the white tail world and what you bring to the table. Well, I think um I don't know. I what I like about uh you know getting started early and and hunting from an early age is it seems like I just have a lot more time than most people do uh, after they, you know, get to college and and get join the workforce and everything like that. And so, me being younger, uh, last year I spent pretty much every every day of the fall hunting whitetails uh, after school or whatever. And I wouldn't have gotten my buck last year if I wouldn't have been able to uh, go out after school every day. So, really, like one of the advantages just being younger is just you get to hunt more often. And you just, you get to build all that experience just because you have a lot of time to be out in the woods. So I think that's one of the advantages. And, you know, I've heard that, uh, you know, several years ago, it seems like hunting recruitment was dying off and, and uh, it seems like less hunters were getting involved in the sport. But now I think that trend, at least around here, has really shifted to more and more people are hunting, especially with all the social media um, involvement. And it seems like, you know, a ton of people are joining hunting and it seems like the sport's only growing. So I think that's really awesome. Yeah. Now, when you talk about youth and everything, after school, you take off. Now, how many of your buddies, guys or gals, are also doing that? It doesn't seem like uh, too many of them are. Uh, A lot of people have sports and other commitments that they have to go to um jobs some people work i've been fortunate enough that i do have quite a bit of time to dedicate to uh you know this is my main passion hunting and my other passions are basically lifting weight so i've basically been able to uh, dedicate all my time to those two passions but i think anyone um who's in school or whatever who is youth can make time to get the experience in the woods if they want to. This past turkey season, I was hunting pretty much every day before school, uh, just hunting for the first hour or so off the roost. So I think it's, and you know, people can do that uh, with their jobs too, but I think being youth and having less of the commitments really allows people to, to get out, get out more and, and enjoy the woods. So I wouldn't say, you know, all of my buddies and friends that I hunt with are quite as crazy as I am with it and get out all the time, but they definitely have more time than than uh, some of the older people with commitments and, and real jobs and stuff. So, Hey, I appreciate the little background. Now, let's talk about your hunting areas. Are you hunting uh, river bottoms or you're hunting croplands? So I grew up hunting in uh, southern Iowa mainly, and 
it was basically just uh we would hunt my grandparents old 40 acre property that they lived on and it was basically a river bluff so there is big ravines and everything like that in the 40 acres that we hunted and then it would drop down into a crop field and there was a river um maybe 400 yards across the field uh from the bluff and so that's what i grew up hunting and that's what a lot of my hunting experience comes from but obviously it's a really uh small acreage and they ended up uh selling that place and now i've expanded to hunting northern missouri we have 160 acre farm down there that's uh just big timber with small clearings and hay fields all around uh not much cropland around there um and so we do quite a bit of hunting down there and within the past couple of years i've started hunting more and more public land around here in uh cedar rapids so i go i mean we'll travel an hour and a half to two hours just to hunt and scout public land in iowa just because most of it is really really good and if we see something on a map that we want to go check out um we're not afraid to drive and have to drive long ways to go hunt it so i hunt just a, a mix of habitats a lot of the public land around here is marsh just because that's if anything's uh not marsh and it's open areas it's typically going to be being farmed and if it's ravines a lot of it's going to be uh private um wooded timber lots that are being hunted so i'd say a, a pretty good majority of the public land here in iowa is marsh habitat and that's not necessarily a bad thing because it is really good white hunting habitat. Um, a lot of it's really diverse. Some of it has marsh and then, you know, the other half of the unit might be cropland and, and ravines and big timber. So I think hunting this public land around here in Iowa really has diversified me to uh, be able to hunt a lot of these different habitats. Yeah, I think in Wisconsin and some of the marshland, um, I hunt along the Bear Bear River. So um, between Baraboo and Hillsborough in that country. And the thing I'd see, we put up tower stands in the marshland. And, you know, it's hard to pattern them um, in the uh, bow hunting season. But gun season, they all just pour off the bluffs, the ag land all around along the Barrow River. And then they just disappear into that marsh ground. And um, it's a heck of a place to hunt, especially during the gun season. Not saying that you... Ha- don't have to, but like we got so much crop land and food plots up on the bluffs that I just don't hunt it in in the um, in the bow season, and so I don't need to. Hey, let's get back to hey, you hunt before school for an hour, then right after school, where are you going? Uh, so those hunts are obviously going to be a little bit more limited to areas that are closer around me and um. I just, I pick some of the, the best areas that I think are within maybe 45 minutes of me uh, and then go from there. A lot of it just has to do with scouting and the place I was turkey hunting this spring, I was basically going back to the same place over and over again because that was the best spot within about an hour of my location. So that's basically where I was um, forced to go the whole time. And it's not necessarily a bad thing because I was learning more and more about this location and the birds I was hunting every time it went out, which was most most days with good weather. So got a lot of experience up there. And did you get a was, did you get a tom? Uh, I had a pretty rough year of turkey hunting. I didn't. I got one Jake down in Missouri, and Trevor got a couple of birds, one in Iowa and one in Missouri. But I had a pretty rough year. Um, I missed one in Missouri because, well, I think it's because I hit too much brush. And uh, it's not like us to miss turkeys, but Trevor missed one too. And it just seems like we had a rough year. Uh, I'd get birds to 50 or 60 yards on the public land all the time and wouldn't be able to uh, seal the deal on them. And one of the taunts I had, I had three or four gobblers really just hammering. and when they were working in and I didn't realize it, but there was another hunter set up. I had thought it was just another hen because there were other hens just mixed in with all the other birds. And 
finally they kind of worked their way back and forth and ended up on a swing down towards him and he shot one of them and of course they all spooked but that was I didn't get the bird but they were probably in range of me too they were just kind of circling around us and uh it was just a really fun hunt for sure I went up to him and congratulated him and I got to see the turkey and and pretty much got the whole hunt on film for the YouTube channel so that was really cool and he was just a really nice guy so I wasn't upset at all with it um and it was almost like as good as killing one for myself and I'm pretty sure that hunt was uh early in the fourth season here in Iowa so I was okay with it because I still had a lot more time to hunt and I was uh kind of happy that my season wasn't over yet now I wish I would have gotten him because I didn't end up getting one, but I definitely got to spend a lot more time out in the woods, which is fun. Let's let's talk to stay right here and talk about public land. Now you get the the home forty. Do you still have that in Iowa? Your grandparents' land? No, they ended up uh, selling that part of their place, and and they just live down there now. But so I'd say the majority of my hunting is just public land here in Iowa anymore, and. I have one small piece of private that I hunt, uh, that I've got permission to hunt right next to, uh, public land that I actually killed my big deer on this past year. So that's the majority of the hunting that I do, which isn't, uh, you know, necessarily a bad thing. Most of the public land around here is just really good whitetail habitat. And if you put in the, the work and put it in the time to really scout it and, you know, I indulge my, basically my whole life into hunting and so I'm always doing something for scouting or doing something for hunting and if you really put your put the time in and and uh put put the effort in put the hard work in getting back to the places that no one else goes you can definitely get into some good deer on Iowa public land and a lot of that has to do with the low draws for not a resident and everything like that um it just seems like the pressure's definitely lower than other states you might go to for public land hunting. So that's so really what nice. Zone, and that's what zone do you hunt? I actually don't know the zone because I never looked into it for non-residents, but I, I'm trying to remember. I can't, I don't think I've ever looked into the zones. Um, because you're north of 80, that, right? You're north of the interstate. Yeah. Just, yeah. It'd just be the eastern Iowa zone. At one point, I'm pretty sure I knew. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, for the out of state people, you know, a lot of people ask me all the time, you know, Iowa's land of the giants. I was at the Iowa Deer Classic as you were. We just didn't know each other then. We'll see you next year. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of people ask me, and I said, you know, there's a lot of public land, but the thing that saves you are, as a resident hunter is non resident hunter, I mean, is that um, a lot of the residents uh, only hunt as as they don't work hard at it? What do you what's your thoughts about that? You know. So yeah, I wanted to. I was going to touch on that. Uh, seems like first of all, seems like most of the residents around here have a place to hunt privately, um, and so they just don't have to hunt the public land around here. And it's not a bad thing for sure. It just seems like. It's not, it's hard to say, but it seems like it's not that hard to gain private permission um, if you just know people. And, uh, and a lot of people don't bow hunt. A lot of people just shotgun hunt and drive hunt. So, of course, that's party hunting. So, they're obviously going to have a, a place to um, hunt deer on private land during that. So, I think a big part of it is a lot of the residents around here just don't have to hunt. The public land and some of the stigmas that you hear is that there's no big deer on public land or it gets too pressured and stuff like that and so a lot of people just don't hunt the public land around here now it still gets plenty of pressure <laughs> believe me but if you just you know work and get back to the places that other people don't go i think you can negate a lot of that because it seems like um I've heard the theory of hunt right next to the access points, um, and a lot of people will walk right by it, and that's where the good deer hunting will be. But it seems like at least around here, uh, that's not the case. I run into tree stands literally 50 yards from the parking lots where people hunt pretty regularly. So it seems like 
Uh, some of the people, at least, don't think you have to get that far back in. And a lot of the people will stop maybe within that first uh, quarter mile, half mile from the access points, which is reasonable because getting a big body deer out of the woods from that far without a cart uh, is not an easy task. I know my my drag on my Iowa buck was a little over a half mile this year, and that <laughs> that was a three hour drag, and we were out of the woods until after midnight. So a lot of people. Um, I guess it might not be worth it for them, or they just don't uh, want to put in that much work, I guess, to get a deer out. And that's fine with me because I'll be back there and I'll be pulling all night if I have to. So uh, I think if you just find the places that you can get back in there farther, you can really get away from a lot of the pressure. And obviously, there's going to be guys like you that uh, feel the same way, and there's obviously going to be guys that will work just as hard as you will. Um, but I think you can cut down a lot on the pressure if you just get back in there and uh, hunt the overlook spots. One thing I wanted to touch on was uh, I was talking about hunting the marsh around here, and it seems to me like uh, a lot of the times the marsh just gets overlooked because uh, people are so used to hunting the big timber and the ravines and the ridges. And so they just don't think to hunt the marshes. Like I grew up hunting uh, that river bluff. And so I hadn't, I had never thought of hunting the marshes until I talked to um, Zach Ferenbaugh of Midwest Whitetail. I talked to him at the Whitetail Deer Classic. We had a great conversation on hunting the marshes and, and deer behavior down there. And it's amazing what these deer will do uh, just living down in these wet areas all year. Uh, just to get away from some of the pressure. And I know bucks can get really big down there and people just don't think to hunt it. It's obviously a lot harder to hunt because of the access and because of how hard it is to walk in it uh, on a lot of the, the marshy areas. But the deer are in there and a lot of people just don't realize that, I think. it's The, the water almost doesn't seem to bother them and they'll just go in there and and lay down all day on, on a high point and that's where they'll be all year until they come out to feed at night or whatever and so i think if you can get back into some of those areas they will get into good hunting as well let's let's talk about hunting because i'm thinking of bear river and some of the stands on the north side of it we're on the south side um the farm and everything and i'm thinking you know there's a few trees but that's why it's gun hunter because they put up we put up star power stands or we used to drive it we don't drive it with 10 or 15 guys anymore and when i first hunted that's how we did it we just drove everything and we'd have a crew you know to be 15 to 20 people and um you know 10 would drive or 15 would drive and five would stand at the pinpoints or the funnels because we knew where they're going to come out it's just you know you had to be there and Let's talk about, because I'm thinking of high points. I know big bucks live down there, but one, it's the high water year. You got to wear hip boots or waders uh, to get Mm -hmm. in. And it's noisy as heck. So how do you come by that? Well, you're obviously going to make noise whenever you're getting in there. And I haven't found a really good way to combat that. Um, You just have to be careful with your access. you know, a lot of times the marshes will have rivers bordering it. So if you can find a way to float and get a kayak or something where you can not make any noise at all and just use the river to access, that's obviously going to be ideal. Uh, usually there's going to be some sort of creek system that runs through it. And so a lot of times I'll hop down to the creeks and just walk up it that way, which is still noisy, especially if you're fighting the current. And it's a ton of work, but it's going to be a lot quieter than walking on the crunchy grass or and and making a bunch of noise with your waders so that's a couple of those are just using the actual waterways themselves can be a lot quieter than walking through the thick marsh and so that's one of the ways i've combated that i guess but yeah if you i was gonna say um you mentioned midwest white tails with bill winky and he's made a science of, of of filming have you ever thought about getting on as an intern with him 
I've thought about it a lot. Uh, he, uh, or when I was talking to Zach Fahrenbaugh, which, by the way, the guys at Midwest Whitetail are just awesome people. They're really nice, and uh, they're just great people. They know a ton about deer hunting, more than uh, I think I'll ever, I'll ever know. Uh, and so they're really fun to talk to, and they're really great people. Um, but he had recommended that I at least apply for pro staff or whatever because we film our hunts and and we enjoyed our conversation together and stuff like that. But so I've thought about it. I've thought about doing the intern thing uh, with them, and I think I'd gain a ton of knowledge about filming and hunting. Uh, so it'd be really good for me. But I'm going on to University of Iowa next year, so I have other commitments. Um, and I wouldn't be able to just go live down there for a whole fall or whatever. So I, the internship is kind of off the table. And as far as pro staffing goes, I've definitely thought about that. But see, I just Bronc Outdoors is my baby. I've put in so much work and time into Bronc Outdoors. And I have such great support from uh, the fans, or at least most of them. And uh so Bronco Outdoors is my baby, and so I couldn't really just give that up uh, to go pro staff for Midwest Whitetail. As much as I'd love to do both things, I'm not sure that it would really work out to uh, have Bronco Outdoors and be pro staff. So I definitely thought about it, but I just couldn't give up all that I put into Bronco Outdoors and everything like that. Well, I appreciate that. And um, What are you going to study at Iowa? I'm going into engineering, so I'm going in undeclared, but I've been leaning towards biomedical. Well, good luck to you. Yeah, good thank school. you. Yeah, good yeah. school. They got a great football program, so you know, have fun. Yeah, we'll do it for sure. So let's let's take a little break here and and tell people how to get a hold of you on social media, where they can reach out to your YouTube channel. Yeah, so our YouTube channel is Bronk Outdoors. And uh, you can go on there and look that up uh, and find all of our stuff on there. You can contact us through any of the comment sections on any of our videos. I try to reply to every single comment, and I at least uh, read every single comment. And you can also get a hold of us on our Instagram page, which is Brunk Out, or at Brunk Outdoors. Uh, and you can uh, DM us with any questions or or comments you might have, and we'll get back to you that way. Folks, I'm putting it up right now. Uh, Brunk Outdoors, if I could spell, that would be better. Brunk Outdoors TV, B-R-U-N-C-K. Uh, yep. Yep, just Brunk Outdoors. You can also find us on our website, which is just www.brunkoutdoors.com. Um, and we do have a Facebook page that we're not quite as active on as we should be, but we do have that as well. Yeah. And I got Brunk Outdoors coming up folks so you can see his, uh, website. So that's at www.brunkoutdoors.com. Brunk Outdoors, reach your peak. Hey, thanks for sharing that. And there's, there's your promo right there. And, uh, we'll just go to about, and you can see something about, uh, Brunk Outdoors. So there's your commercial, and I want to give a shout out for Wilderness Athlete and Fit to Hunt. I just finished my 28 day challenge, and uh, it went really well. And I'm excited um, to be continued sponsored by Wilderness Athlete and Fit to Hunt. So let's let's go, and that's a great segue. Fit to Hunt. We talked about that, and your passion about lifting. You blew out your your knees uh, wrestling. And so now it's just you and the weights. And uh, are you a gym rat? Uh, you could say that, I guess. Yeah. I, uh, like I said, my my two passions are hunting. That's number one. I'm always going to do that. Uh, and then I guess my second one would be lifting weights and and everything that goes along with that. And I got involved with that just through sports. Uh, I loved football and wrestling up until kind of my freshman year when I, I tore both of my shoulders. I've torn the labrums in both of them and had to get them surgically repaired. Uh, my first one was my freshman year in high school. 
and uh, ended up coming back to wrestling in my junior year. I had to take my sophomore year off because of that injury, and then I tore my my other shoulder. So I haven't been able to get back into sports, but um, I can still lift and and be really active in the gym, which I enjoy. I can't just sit around and and do nothing. I have to uh, do some stuff. So I really oh, I appreciate enjoy it. that. I yeah. was going to say, I appreciate that. And I said, hey, I was incorrect, listeners. I thought in the warm-up he had set his knees. I wasn't listening. So it is his shoulder. And last October, I came out of the mountains after sheep hunting and had my uh, right shoulder pinned because I tore it. I tore the bicep and I tore the rotator cuff. And I was a mess. But I'm mm-hmm. good now. I'm back in the gym like yourself. And, you know, I just say, folks, uh, you got to commit the, to your health. And there's no better place to do that. Uh, then uh, cardio and then get on high rep. I'm in high rep uh, weights. So talk about why fitness is important for a whitetail hunter. You gave us one insight for dragging a big buck out, but what else? Yeah, so obviously whenever you're getting those long drags, you're going to need to be uh, pretty fit just to survive them. It seems like I remember on my dragging that big buck out, uh, you might think I'm exaggerating, and it might be a, a bit of exaggeration, but this buck had to weigh close to 300 pounds. It was the biggest body deer I've ever seen. And thankfully, I had a, one of my – he's actually going to be my roommate down in college next year, but he was helping me drag him out. And he was – he's just as involved in fitness as I am, so he's strong as an ox. And thankfully, I had him for to help me, but we would – drag maybe 10 or 15 yards and we'd have to take a break and and finally we're getting closer to the car and we're like all right this is going to be the last drag we can get him from here and then three breaks later we're still dragging so that gives you a little bit of an insight on how tough some of those drags can be so obviously you need to be pretty physically fit uh to do that or have a nice deer cart which i finally went and bought but other than that just uh it's important to be physically fit just to be able to get back into those places that you need to be at. I mentioned using trick systems to uh, get back into the marsh. And if you're walking against the current, it's amazing how difficult that can be. Uh, I think <coughs> I walked a uh, half mile up current um, last winter getting into a deer spot. I almost killed a big buck last night, that night. So it was almost worth it. But I remember I was just drenched in sweat and dog tired by the time I got up there. So it's really important to be physically fit for that. And uh, as far as anything like that goes, I think whitetail hunting, you don't have to be as much into it as you do with elk hunting in the mountains. Uh, we take a week long trip every year to Colorado uh, in September to hunt elk. So that's another big reason that we're into fitness. And if you're not fit for the mountains, you're uh <laughs> You're going to get your butt kicked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's really important out there. You'll just get <laughs> ate up and spit out by the mountains if you go out there and, and you haven't been doing anything all year. That's for sure. Now, let's go back um, to uh, stealth approach, uh, especially in the marsh. And, you know, I know a lot of guys use kayaks. They'll use canoes uh, or they'll wade. And the thing I just wanted to always be safe because it's easy to wade in the in the daylight when you're coming out in the dark man <clears throat> everything is harder even with a headlamp and you know i just want to add my two cents you know i know some people that wear pfds personal flotation devices they get the yoke or, or vest type that is really easy really lightweight and stearns has them a lot of places have them but if you're going to spend a lot of time you know, in the water, in the creeks, in your kayak, canoe, whatever, always wear that. Because unfortunately, I know a couple of people that have died. They simply drowned because they got waders on, something happened, and, um, you know, they didn't have a way out. That's so that's my two mention. cents. On... Go yeah, ahead. That's great. that's great to mention. Uh, yeah, I should add, if there's, if I'm coming back during the dark or uh, even going in during the dark, if there's any way to avoid getting in the water with hip boots or whatever, uh, I do try to avoid that. You know, you should always account for your personal safety 
before you uh, worry about getting your deer or whatever. I think that's really important to note, and I'm glad you brought that up. A lot of times, especially in the marsh, uh, if you're using like an oxbow lake instead of a creek, sometimes the the bottoms of those oxbow lakes will be really washed out in places, and it can drop off, and you can just be swallowed up by that hole in the hole in the lake before you know it. So it's really important to keep that in mind and go really slow whenever you are walking through any of these waterways. Yeah, thanks for that. So let's change it up and close up the show with Brunk Outdoors. How did you start? What's it doing when people go to the site? Uh, what are they going to see? So if you go to web, our website, uh, we have, you can stop by the homepage and we have a little bit of a, a promo video, I guess, flashing by from our um, entry into the Kui Film Festival. That's a, The full video is up on our YouTube page. And you can see everything, uh, our about section, which is basically our bio. And you can read that if you go to brunkoutdoors.com. You can also shop some merchandise. Uh, we have three hat hats available, and uh, you can pick those up or look at them if you want to do that. Uh, we'll also be working on some more merchandise and a couple of other big projects coming up. Uh, but it's all stemmed off of our YouTube channel. And basically, we just got involved uh, just doing our YouTube channel for fun. And I uploaded my first video, which was a Hoyt Nitrum Turbo tuning video, uh, just to do it for fun and to uh, hopefully help people tune their bows. And I ended up posting that to one of the forums I'm involved with, to Archie Talk. And the response to that was really great. So uh, we just kept building off of that. And uh, we quickly realized that the YouTube channel and filming our hunts and, and posting them to that had become a separate passion in itself just from hunting in general. And we love that aspect of it. Uh, we love interacting with all the people on the channel. Um, any of the comments that we get are usually pretty positive. So it's really nice to be able to respond to those and get feedback from all of our fans like that uh and it, and so yeah that's uh become kind of a separate passion for us and we've uh if you go to our youtube channel you'll notice uh part of the the page is video blogs and i want to talk quickly about those and basically every time we go hunting or scouting or do anything for deer hunting really uh or any hunting at all we'll post a video blog about it and basically all those are just documenting the hunt or the scouting mission that we did. And we put that up uh, within the, the next day or so after that hunt. So what that allows us to do is use all the footage that we just had from the hunts instead of just letting them sit. And for the viewer, it lets people know what's going on really up to date. Uh, they can follow uh, maybe rut action or anything like that. Um, they can see what's going on in the woods in that time of year, uh, and they can just keep really up to date with us on all of our hunting adventures. And I think it's really good, uh, just for the industry, uh, just because it shows that hunting's not always a fairy tale and it shows how much work, uh, goes into one successful hunt. Um, you know, you can watch a, uh, TV show, an outdoor TV show, and you'll see, you know, three kills in a half hour show. And what you don't see is the the week long hunt to get to that point before they killed their animal. And so I think it's really good to just post these video blogs showing uh, every hunt that along the way to get to the end result or of the success if you if you term success or success as killing your animal. I think it's really good to just post those so people can experience that and learn from any of our mistakes. A lot of times uh, they'll be really informative, just showing what we've learned from that hunt and uh, showing you any of the mistakes we made so that hopefully the viewer doesn't have to make them themselves. So I really like that section of it. And uh, another section of the channel is just um, helpful tips that I may think of 
shooting bows, tuning bows, and uh, any hunting tips that I may have. So that's basically the YouTube channel. Um, if you want to go check that out, I think you'd really enjoy it. I put a lot of time into it, and uh, I love doing it. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about Trevor and your dad and how involved they're with Brunk Outdoors. So Trevor and I uh, do most of the filming and editing for the YouTube channel and do pretty much everything with that. Uh, and Trevor uh, does a lot of the Instagram for us. I'd say he does the majority of the Instagram work. Um, I'd obviously do some as well. And I do the majority of the YouTube work. So it's a really good balance um, between us to get all the content up for everyone and not be so swamped because we both uh, participate a lot. And dad uh, is the one who takes us on all these hunts. So he doesn't do any filming, um, but without him, none of this would be possible. And uh, we wouldn't be able to go on our elk hunts, anything like that. And obviously he's the one who got us started in hunting. So uh, anytime we're hunting with him, He's obviously going to be on video because we film all of our hunts, but he doesn't take a, he doesn't self film at least when he's deer hunting. I've gotten a couple of his kills on video just going with him because I love uh, getting back to your roots and just hunting with your dad. It's really fun. Uh, so that's how he's involved with it, but everyone just does their part and it's really manageable. Uh, it's really fun working with Trevor and we enjoy the heck out of it. So. Well, thanks for that. And you make me want on my way to uh, Wisconsin this fall. I just we might talk about it and just I'll head your way and, and I'll get in the woods with you. Obviously, not obviously, but I don't have a tag, you know, for, for Iowa. But that would be fun because I go oh, yeah. right by, you know, I go, you know, right by it. That's for sure. Uh, when I have, head, up, head up to uh, Wisconsin, I either go north in Des Moines or uh north of you guys of iowa city it's iowa city right off 80 i'm in uh yeah cedar yeah. rapids i'm yeah. in cedar rapids i would say right. just no just south what's the interstate there i i'm drawing a blank uh interstate 380 380 yeah so anyway folks uh we've had a great talk with hunter brunk Again, you can find them on the YouTube channel. That's that's their place in social media. They're also up on Instagram. And, and check them out because Hunter, like I said, he's one of the uh, young guns of uh, the whitetail world, and, he, and he's got game, and it just shows you what a young guy can do still in high school. He's mature. You're, you're watching his video. Um, he just he just rocked the, his show. So on behalf of our thousands of listeners across North America, Hunter, uh, thank you so much. And before we go, how about giving a shout out to your sponsors or your brother, whoever you want, take a minute or so, and then we'll be, we'll be traveling on. Yes. First of all, I just, uh, you gotta say thanks to my family. Obviously Trevor, uh, thank you to him for putting in, um, all the work that he does for Bronco Doors. He's really been kicking butt lately and I'm really appreciative of that. Unfortunately, uh, he's up in Wisconsin doing, a a summer job so he can be on the show. Um, we were trying to find a, a time when we could both be on it and that would have been really nice. Uh, but we just, just decided to have me go on the show and, uh, get that rolling. So maybe another time we can have both of us on and that'd be really nice. Uh, but I'd also like to thank my dad for all, all that he does and for getting us involved in hunting and showing us a lot of what we know and teaching us. So I just want to say thanks to my family. Thank you to my mom. Uh, if she's watching this, uh, for always supporting us and all of our hunting adventures, you know, we put in gobs of time throughout the year to this passion. And, uh, I just want to thank her for always supporting us and being patient with us as we spend all this time doing what we love. Uh, and so I'll thank some of our sponsors. Now, uh, we work with mountain ops, Athens Archery, um, we work with uh, Last Chance Archery, Remington Scent Control is a big one, um, you know, Philip at Remington Scent Control, 
They're just great guys and uh, great products. And uh, I'm trying to think, I think I'm missing one. Um, should have wrote, wrote, written them out. But anyway, uh, if you want to check out all of our sponsors, they're uh, listed on all of our videos. And if you go check that out. So thank you to all of them. They make great products. We wouldn't uh, be working with them if we didn't believe on in what they did and if we didn't personally use their products ourselves. Oh, the last one is uh, um, X stand tree stand. Sorry, I was forgetting that last one. We just started working with them recently. So really excited about all of them and thank them for the continued support. So again, let's wrap the show. It's, it's really been a pleasure and I look forward to, you know, maybe changing my route up a little bit. And we can get you and Trevor on the show. We'll just do it right from, right from your house right now, right where you are. And, yeah. uh, yeah, we can have a great show, uh, in the morning or at noontime because we'll probably be hunting morning and in the evening, but I'd yeah, love to, yeah. you know, I'd love to spend some time with you, you know, um, uh, and just watching him. Can you long distance, um, glass and watch, watch your tree stands? So do you have your tree stand where I could set up in my truck or, um, or a hill or ridge so I wouldn't, you know, be on top of you because you film your own? Uh, probably not. Um, you know, I hunt wherever I find myself. I'm, I'm always being really mobile and I don't really have just set stands. Uh, it's a big thing with the X stand. Uh, they have their backcountry combo that will allow me to be really mobile this fall. And, uh, last fall I was doing a lot of mobile hunts, just ground hunting. So I basically hunt wherever I can find a spot that I want to sit down and, and hunt deer. So probably wouldn't work for the long range uh, watching, but you can come along with me. I'm sure we can get in there and it won't bother a thing. You can just be right there with me. Well, Hunter, again, this is the third time I close the show on behalf of thousands of listeners across North America. <laughs> thanks so much for being a guest on Whitetail Roundup. And I can't wait to watch your career build and see where it goes and how you blossom as a young gun in the Whitetail world. Yeah, thanks for having me. On our next episode, we're heading out to L.A. What's what's Whitetail Rendezvous doing in L.A.? Well, there's a gentleman out there, Sam Ayers, and he has a podcast called Living Country in the City. And it's all about how a city guy turned country and how he handles different subject matters, eating organic. You know, venison is organic. But Sam is really lighting it up with his wit, with his understanding, and his way he communicates with all sorts of people. Sam Ayers, living in the country, living country in the city. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.